Okay, hello to people who are rolling in. We're gonna wait a minute or two for the rest of the attendees to show up. So it'll be a bit, so you can just enjoy our lovely faces and backgrounds. I have this lovely lamp, this hideous chair um, that I don't like very much. It's not comfortable, <laughs> but that's okay. Yeah, to do it with my white background, you know, so that's uh, that's what it is. That's, uh, yeah, see, it doesn't. I can't tell if there's like anything. Yeah, it's, it's even it's real. I mean, you know, I mean, I was thinking about putting a virtual one, but you know, I don't need it because it's you know it is what it is. So yeah, just the white background. Unless, unless you want to do shameless advertising for your institution. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I could do that. Maybe I can call someone. I mean. Uh, <laughs> That's what you do, actually. You know, that's uh, exactly. yes, yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Do they make you? Do they make you put that up, or do you pick? No. Do you, no? Oh, okay. No, Because no. I know, I know, some people at the beginning, some, some, some schools were like making, making professors use the slides or use the <laughs> backgrounds, but it yeah, seems yeah. to be more common now, just of choice, I guess. Yeah, I, I started that during my teaching because I, I thought that otherwise it might be distracting for the students. Mm -hmm. Just uh, yeah. look all, at all the funny things that, that I may have behind me rather than <laughs> at you. trying to explain. But... Yeah. Okay. Hey, everyone, to people who are still rolling in, we're, we're letting the rest of the attendees show up. So it'll be, um, we're going to wait for the attendee count to slow down a little bit. Um, about, I don't know, probably 30 seconds. Um, I mean, there is something to be said though for having interesting things in your background. Like I, I moved and I used to have a piano and like, I think that I, it, it made me seem more interesting than I am. <laughs> now I have nothing. I've just got this lamp and chair. Yeah. Okay, it looks like the attendee count is starting to slow down. So why don't we go ahead and uh, get started for the day. So everyone, welcome to the Microstructure Exchange. I'm Cameron Pfeiffer, I'm from the University of Oregon. Um, and so today we have, we're delighted to have Hans de Heerse, uh, which I screwed up, I'm sorry. Um, and he's gonna talk about priority rules. Um, but before we get to that, I just have like, I'm gonna go over the format. So Hans is gonna talk for 45 minutes. He's gonna have two pre-selected breaks. Um, and during those breaks, um, I'm going to read questions from the Q&A. So you can go to the Q&A function on the bottom and type in your question and I'll read it out during one of the breaks. Um, I believe Nick, uh, the co-author, he's also in, he's also online and he may be answering some of the questions as well. Um, and then after the 45 minute presentation, there's gonna be a 15 minute Q&A where uh, it's over voice. So you can raise your hand, we'll call on you to turn on your mic and you can talk to Hans directly. Um, and then um, Hans has agreed to stay on for as long as there's questions basically um, after the, um, the, the hour mark. Um, and that should cover most of the format stuff. Um, and then there's an ad additional announcement. If you didn't see in the newsletter or haven't heard like the rumor mill. So um, Albert Mengfeld and some other people are doing this um, like crowdsourced microstructure uh, science thing called fincap.academy. Um, you can see it on the, if you go to the website, the microstructure.exchange and scroll to the bottom, there's a little announcement with a link to the website, but it's also, I think, fincap.academy. Um, and um, if you were a, a microstructure researcher, which maybe you are, because you're here, um, you can go sign up as a research team to, to basically like um, help test this very interesting hypothesis. And there's some really cool Deutsche Bors, uh data to use. Um, so give that a look. Okay, that is all I had. So Hans, um, take it away. Okay, so thanks a lot, Cameron. Thanks a lot for to the organizers for having me or having us exactly on election day. You know, so it's a very important day. Um, pre primarily, I think due to the election, but also for having the opportunity to present this paper on priority rules. So this is a joint work with uh, Nico, Nick Karagianis, who just moved actually to Manchester Business School. So what is this paper about? So what is the motivation for this paper? Well, probably needless to say in this audience is the, the big research question is how to design securities markets such that investors are able to come together in space and time and such that investor welfare is going to be maximized. 
And priority rules are an important element of this market design in reaching this objective. The reason is that priority rules determine how trades are going to be allocated within a venue, but also across the venues. And so our paper is going to address this question about, you know, how, does, how do priority rules affect trading rates and welfare in a market? So why are priority rules in trading important? Well, if you look at most jurisdictions, most countries, we observe that they have a best execution obligation, that is, they have price priority. For example, in the US, the trade through prohibition implies that there is price priority within a market, but also across different trading platforms. Okay, so trades are executed against the best price. But what happens when we are at the same price? So how are trades allocated within and across platforms? You know, so if everything is the same price, you know, how are we going to allocate this? Are we doing this randomly or there are other rules? And so this secondary priority rules or precedent rules are going to be important both within a trading venue or a trading platform and across trading platforms. And so let me first motivate this within one venue and then secondly motivate this across venues. So the priority rules in trading within one venue, so the main types that we can see there are price time priority and price broker time priority. And this is what we are going to develop in detail next. So to give to, to shape ideas, let me illustrate this with the following example. So suppose that we have at the order book sell side that we have two orders at the same price, 22.12, each with a quantity of 100, but one order there the seller uses broker A and this order arrived at 10.04. The second order is submitted through broker B and has arrived at 10.09. Suppose now that at 10 past 10, a buyer arrives using broker B and who wants to buy 100 shares at this price 22.12. Here comes the allocation rules. Here enter the allocation rules. So if we have price time priority, then the arriving order of broker B is going to execute against the order by broker A because this arrived earlier. In contrast, when we're having price broker time priority, what we're going to have is that the arriving order of broker B is going to execute against this order by broker B, submitted through broker B, even though this arrived later in the queue. So this means that we're going to have queue jumping taking place. So other mechanisms might be price random matching. So this would be that you know we toss a coin and we basically we execute either against broker A or broker B. And of course, these allocation rules are going to have impacts on you know whether you want to submit a limit order in the first place or whether you might want to move to a market order or you know how how long you want to stand in the queue. So what do we observe in the reality? When we look at the US, so the most financial markets have price time priority. However, before 1996, some of the exchanges had price broker time priority. And also more recently, investors exchange before it adopted the, to, to become a national security exchange had this price broker time priority as its allocation mechanism. Furthermore, the New York Stock Exchange uses a parity priority model. Somehow the main idea there being that later arriving orders may actually jump the queue. So it's not always price time priority that is taking place in markets. When we look at Canadian financial markets, there we have price broker time priority, PBT. In Europe, the Nordic countries have PBT. The Euronext, its internal matching service has PBT. And even with the MIFID II, so the Market and Financial Instruments Directive, the second version of this, you know, the European regulation, even has frequent batch auctions with having, in some cases, broker price time priority. That is just to say, you know, there is an additional layer in between price and time that might play an important role. So this is for one venue. Let's then focus on, you know, across venues. Again, when we are looking at you know, orders across venues, there we are going to have price priority. But when at the same price, some brokers may have a preference for one platform over another. And there could be several reasons for this. One reason could be that you know, there is an affiliated venue because a broker has an ownership stake in a particular venue and therefore 
when at the same price is going to direct all its order flow to that particular platform. Maybe there are volume based fees you know, that a broker can pocket and therefore it's going to send all its orders to the same platform. So this could imply that we have a price platform time priority. And we may have the situation where every broker may prefer another platform due to these different affiliated venues, okay? And so what we are going to study here is, you know, in our setup, we're going to try to study, you know, what is the impact of this additional layer in terms of secondary priority rule in allocation decisions. So what are our research questions? So the first research question is, is there a one size fits all priority rule that is going to maximize welfare? Secondly, do markets endogenously adopt this optimal priority rule or do we need regulatory intervention in order to uh, arrive at that? And then thirdly, of course, we will need a friction here in the market and this friction is going to be the tick size that is somehow going to prevent that we can undercut. And so what we are going to exploit here is the role of the relative tick size. And so when I'm talking about tick size, we should think about the tick size relative to the dispersion and the private values for the assets. Okay, so that's the relative tick size that, that we are after. And we're going to look at the role of this relative tick size in the optimal um, um, priority rule that is, uh, that is at work. So let me very briefly go over the related literature. So there is lots of related literature on limit order books. What we contribute to this literature is put in red there is that, so typically those models have either limit order staying in the book for one period, or if not, they assume price time priority. So we are going to look at other allocation rules. We contribute to the literature on over the counter markets. Again, typically there is, there is no queuing or random allocation is assumed. We contribute to the literature on trading on multiple platforms because we are going to look at priority rules within one venue or preferencing of platforms. And finally, we are also contributing to the literature on queuing and speed in markets because we are looking at the role of priority rules in this, um, in this game. So let me come to the main takeaways. So before you know, you all go out and vote, um, I hope you do that. Um, so what are the main takeaways? So firstly, priority rules are going to determine trading volume and investor welfare. And what we are going to have is that with small relative ticks, that means, or that is the tick relative to, to heterogeneity in private values, welfare is going to be higher with price time priority. In contrast, when we have white ticks, welfare is going to be higher with price broker time priority. Secondly, when brokers are offered the choice, then between price time and price broker time, brokers are going to adopt price broker time when they are offered the choice. And so regulatory intervention may be required when the tick is small, because in that case, we have that price time priority is preferred. And then finally, as a side note, you're going to argue that markets that have price time priority are actually going to provide incentives for of exchange reporting because you may have incentives to take some orders out of the queue such that they are going to be executed. So maybe let me stop here for the first round of Q&A, um, um, Cameron. Okay, we don't have any questions yet in the Q&A, but I have one actually okay, clarifying please. question. So is the, the mechanism here for, for PBT, is that, um, brokers having an internal matching engine, or is that at the exchange level? The exchange so, implements PBT. So this is so so this is at the exchange level. So thanks for your question. So this is at the exchange level. So so it's often the exchange who is implementing, who is basically offering the service if you want to the broker, such that all orders are going to go to the exchange. But indeed, if there is a standing order in the book that could be executed against you know, your own arriving market order that is going to be, um, going to be executed. So this is not, it's not internalization, it's internalization if you want, but on the book offered by the, by the exchange. Okay. okay. And so within, within a particular country, do you have, um, how, how, how common is it that you have both PBT and a PT exchange that you can go to? So, um, so of course, it's, it's the, that's a good question, you know, so I didn't then do any, let's say, uh, um, gross overview, or let's say, of, all, of what happens at all countries. Um, but of, so, so what may happen, of course, is whether the regulator is going to allow this or not. Okay, and as in some countries, they basically say, you know, 
um, it's only price time priority and, and nothing else. Of course, then we may still have other facets of the game being, for example, hidden orders, okay, which, you know, which may also arrive earlier, but in the end, you know, um, get to the back of the queue because they have other dimensions, okay? Cool. Okay, okay. I'm good. You can proceed. Yeah, thank you. So let me, before going into the model, let me nevertheless stress again that our model, so, th so what we're going to analyze is we are going to compare price time to price broker time within one venue, but our model has the same uh, interpretation if you want for, if you go to multiple platforms. So, so our analysis actually easily converts to a model with two platforms where each broker would have a price platform time priority. Okay, so, so it's, it's basically observationally equivalent if you want in terms of the setting. But for focus, I'm going to focus here on price time versus price broker time priority. So let me come to the assumptions of the model. Um, so we're going to have a relatively easy model if you want. So we will need to make some simplifying assumptions in order you know, to, to be able to solve this model. So you are going to have an infinite horizon discrete time model where a market is modeled as a limit order book. And we are going to focus on one asset, so a single asset, which is traded, which has a fundamental value uh, V, which is common knowledge. And so this is going to be stable. Okay, so we are not going to have innovations, and this is for simplicity. You know, we could potentially change this, but you know, for simplicity, we, we keep it like this. So every period, a trader is going to arrive, and buyers and sellers are going to arrive with the same probability. And so every trader wants to trade one unit maximum, and they have private valuations for the assets, which are drawn from this uniform distribution zero to two. Again, this is general, you know, but this is a specific example here, implying that the valuation for the asset is equal to B times V, okay? So this implies that, you know, the maximum dispersion in private valuations is going to be equal to two times V. That is, you know, let's say, suppose I'm, I'm a buyer, I may have a valuation to V, I may be a seller, which really hates the object, is, I'm going to have a valuation which is equal to zero. So the maximum dispersion valuation here is be, going to be equal to two V, okay? And of course we can scale this to any, you know, common value that is out there, okay? So what we're going to have is that, we're going to assume that competition drives the ask and the bid prices to the tick, which is equal to delta, so which is the most competitive level. And for simplicity, we're going to assume that this, that this tick is symmetric around V. And we're going to exploit this heterogeneity in this tick size delta. So furthermore, you know, we're going to have dealer specialists, which stand ready to provide liquidity at the ask and the bid. But following market practice, when at the same price, the limit order book will have precedence over the dealer specialist. Okay, so basically, so this assumption here, we are relaxing this, you know, in extensions. But this is going to simplify our game quite a bit, because you know this allows us to 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 make sure that you can always submit a market order that would be executed either against a limit order standing or alternatively at at the dealer. Okay, so and this makes our our life easier. In order to say something meaningful about, you know, um, priority rules, the extension that we really need is that limit orders are going to stay in the book for the minimum being two periods, okay? So that is, if those orders are unfilled, they are going to expire. So we assume two brokers, and so again, the minimum that we need, that have equal market shares of buyers and sellers, and every investor is going to be affiliated to one broker, okay? So that's going to be the friction, you know? So an investor is affiliated to one broker, um, so you do not affiliate with two brokers because of course that would solve the problem, but that's the friction you're having in our model. And so in our base model, you're going to have complete transparency. Again, an extension to relax this, so this means that we are going to have transparency about the time that the order is already in the book and about the broker affiliation. That is, when I arrive into the book, I can see whether that trader is using my own broker or whether it's using somebody else's broker. So what is then the decision problem for the trader? Well, upon arrival, a trader will be able to trade either through a market order, through a limit order, or simply refrain from trading because maybe you like the object a lot, okay? And so the trader's decision is going to be influenced by her personal valuation, 
whether she's a buyer or a seller, the state of the order book, and I'm going to, to explain this in detail next. And thirdly, in case of price broker time, her broker affiliation. Okay, and we are going to solve for the mark of steady state equilibrium of the game. So let me now come to the model and focus on the relevant states with price time priority. And so our design implies that you know, there are only two relevant states. So then let's focus here on the seller. Okay, so, you know, think about elections, you know, somebody sent me a shirt, you know, to me and, you know, and it was mentioning, you know, party, okay? The problem was wrong party, okay? You know, so it could have been one party or the other, but it's a wrong party, okay? And basically, you know, I must, I'm willing to sell that, that document, that, uh, that, uh, that shirt, okay? So a seller arriving to the market may face two, um, situations. So either, you know, at the ask site, the book is empty. So this means, you know, there is no competition or there is an order, but that expires immediately. So this means, you know, in this case, you know, if I submit a limit order, I'm going to be the first in line. Alternatively, I may end up in the market and I may say, shit, you know, there is one standing order out there that doesn't expire. Okay. So this is going to influence my decision. That's with price time priority. Let's now focus on price broker time priority. Again, we may have the empty state, meaning I arrive into the book and say, yes, you know, there's nobody in front of me. It may be attractive to submit a limit order. In contrast, again, we may have competition. There may be an order standing in front of me, but here there is going to be a difference. I may face what we call soft competition, or I may face tough competition. What do I mean with soft competition? I arrive into the market and I see, okay, there is somebody there, but you know, it's not that bad. Why? Because it's somebody from the other broker. So it means if I would stand behind that, that order, you know, in the next period, I may already jump that guy because remember we have price broker time priority. In contrast, we may also have tough competition. I arrive into the market and say, shit, you know, sorry, I probably shouldn't say this, but I say, yeah, look, I see something, you know, somebody is standing there and even worse, it's somebody from my own type. So this means, you know, I'm going to think twice before I'm going to submit a limit order. So what is the implication of this? So let's now look at, you know, what traders are going to do, you know, in the case of, of an empty state, and we are going to try to compare what happens with price time versus price broker time priority. And so, so on the left-hand side, we have price time. On the right-hand side, we have price broker time priority. So this is our beta distribution. So recall, we have a seller. We were looking at a seller. So if you really like the shirt wrong party, you know, then it's not wrong party, then it's really correct party, you know, then you don't want to sell it. If it is really a bad, you know, the bad party, then, you know, if you really have a very low valuation, then you want to submit a market order. If you are in between, you're willing to submit a limit order. Let's now compare the same behavior for the trader arriving in a, an empty book where, where we have price broker time. What we can now learn is that some of those traders which would have submitted the limit order are now going to submit a market order. And the reason is that they anticipate that even though they are first in the queue, you know, somebody else may stand behind them and they may be jumped later on. So this anticipation effect is going to push them towards submitting, converting their initial thought of limit order towards a market order. So the threat of being jumped is going to be reflected already today in your um, order going to um, converting your order towards a market order. Let's now look at the competition state. So that is, there is somebody standing in front of me and this order doesn't expire immediately. So again, people who have, let's say a, a large, a very low willingness to pay, you know, very low private values are going to submit a market order. Those in between a limit order and the others are not going to trade at all. Let's again compare the left-hand side, which is price time relative to PBT, soft competition and tough competition. Suppose we have soft competition. So there is somebody in front of me. Now in this case, you know, and it's even somebody from, from the other side of the market that is who is using another broker. 
The implication is going to be that some people are going to say, instead of submitting a market order, I'm going to join the queue. Why? It's as if the queue is much shorter than with price time priority. So we have a queue joining effect. In contrast, when we have tough competition, you know, then I see there is somebody standing in front of me. Okay, I will not, and it uses the same broker. I cannot jump that guy. If I stand behind that person, I may be jumped in the future myself, okay? So this means that some of those people are going to also convert towards a market order. If we aggregate those two effects, what we see is that on average, there is going to be a queue joining effect when you're talking about price broker time. So intuitively, it's as if the queue is not that long because you know there is a likelihood that you will be able to jump um, the queue later on, okay? So what are then our empirical predictions? Well, you know, as already mentioned, you know, when we have the empty state, we have this anticipation effect with price broker time. So we're going to see more people submitting market orders. When there is competition, we are going to see more traders having a queue joining effect. That is, they want to join the queue in case we have price broker time. And so those two forces are going to determine, you know, the, the, the behavior of the traders and ultimately the trading rate and the welfare of investors, okay? So what are the, so maybe I should, is it, is it okay if I stop here for a second, maybe, you know, for the Q&A, second Q&A? Sure. Yeah, actually we have, a, we have a good question from Pankaj. Um, okay. So um, Pankaj's question is that actually a really interesting one for this model, um, is how important, this quantity assumption is right because you have you have homogenous traders who always demand one unit, um, and so Pankaj notes that um, institutional traders often have a utility function, which wants them to trade many units, so they have quantity priority across platforms. So um, sacrificing they they sacrifice some like price benefit to trade larger quantities. Um, and so it's basically why uh, the SEC allowed intermarket sweep order exceptions to the reg NMS price requirements. So do you have a feeling for how important that homogeneity is in your model? So, so that's, that's a very good question and very tough one to, to, to answer. I mean, so we haven't thought about, let's say, volume heterogeneity. Um, um, so of course, one, one thing would be, I mean, I'm going to, to come back, let's say, to this to this uh, pro rata matching, you know, um, and so that would be, so to some extent, you know, by putting in larger quantities, you would have maybe a larger likelihood, or at least let's say a lot, let's say the same fraction, you would be able to execute, let's say, larger, larger fractions. Um, so, so of course, if you have, let's say, larger volumes, which would be um, um, having, let's say, a potential preferential treatment, then to the extent you know that let's say the, the the smaller traders are taking this into account, you know this might be actually with the NYSE um, idea. You know, if those floor traders have actually some more priority over the limit orders, then in that case, you know, you're going to be even more pushed towards submitting market orders. Okay, so so that's I think you know would be one additional force to submitting more market orders, even more than what we have now. Okay, right. yeah. Um, we also have another question from uh, Marius Zoakam, um, mm -hmm. which is, so in practice, can traders know the broker affiliation of other orders? So do you see the broker ID? So that's a good question. So I think, you know, if I'm correctly informed, for example, in the Nordic markets, they can. Um, but it, this is also not crucial for our model. So we also solve the game, you know, where we don't have this broker affiliation. The game actually becomes even easier and the main insights remain the same. So it's still, if, if there is somebody in front of you, you know, it's still, um, you're still having this anticipation effect, you know, that, you know, you may still be jumped with a, with a, with a certain likelihood. Firstly, and secondly, you know, even if it would not be, let's say, completely transparent, it could be that the broker know, I mean, let's say, assume that the broker monitors the game the broker should know somehow, you know, where this order is in the queue, um, you know, and so the broker may actually use, potentially use this information to optimally, you know, um, how should I say, pause on the order. So even if it is not publicly available, maybe the broker has the information and could use it in its decision making. Cool. Those are the two questions we have for now, so you can okay. continue. Yep. Thank you. Okay, so let me then come to the empirical predictions. So I'm not going to spend 
too much time on the first one. So we have, as in Parlour's, as in Christine Parlour's paper, we have again systematic patterns in order flow which have nothing to do with information. And the systematic patterns are going to differ between price time and price broker time. And so in particular, what we have is that if that is price broker time, this is the Q joining effect. You're actually going to, it's more likely that you're going to see cons two consecutive limit orders arriving in the game than, um, than in the price time priority um, um, uh, rule. The second thing, I'm kind of struggling here. The second thing is, is that we have empirical predictions related to debt, to the depth of the market, at least the depth of the limit or the book. And so what we find is that the average depth is lower in the price broker time compared to price time priority. And so you could say that this is a, let's say a little bit different than the Foucault and Mengfeld result, because you know, if you think about a multiple platform theory, they are having more liquidity. The reason for this result is the anticipation effect. So here in this game, you know, if there is an order standing, a limit order standing, this is going to push some traders to submit a market order instead of a limit order. And so the implication is going to be that the limit order book is going to be less deep. That is, you know, it's less often there's going to be a limit order in case of, um, of price broker time. And so that's different if you want relative to the, to the to Thierry's and, and Albert's paper, because there, you know, you cannot switch between market orders and limit orders. There is no choice. And so that's a different result. And then the second thing that we are having here is that, you know, that we are going to see more volatility in depth because, you know, with price broker time, you know, you may jump the queue and an order may expire at the same point in time. So you might have much more volatile depth. So let me now try to convince you of the role of the heterogeneity in the tick size and try to compare the two forces, so recall we have the anticipation effect and we have the queue joining effect, the different role they play when comparing situations where the tick is small relative to situation where the tick is wide. And so I'm going to compare PBT relative to PT. So it's a relative comparison. So think about when the tick is small, think about this very, very, very tiny, okay? Then the anticipation effect is going to be quite large. Why is this? you know, converting your limit order into a market order is not very costly because you know the tick is very small. So, you know, you pay the spread, but the spread is very small. This is going to imply that we're going to have lots of trades, you know, so we're going to have a higher trading rate, but since there are few limit orders in the book, you're going to have lots of trades against the dealer specialist and few trades among each other, among traders, among investors, okay? And so since you are caring here in this model, you know, only about investor welfare, you know, because dealers, we model them as such that all the rents are completed away. You know, we only care here about investor welfare. This is going to imply that you have lower generated investor welfare. So you have this disconnect between trading and investor welfare because there's lots of intermediation going on. Let's focus on the situation where we have white ticks. You know, if the tick is white, it becomes interesting to start making the market that is to submit limit orders. This also implies that with price broker time, this skew joining effect is going to be very considerable because it's very interesting to start behind because you may still jump later on. So you're going to have a lower trading rate, but the trades that you're going to execute are going to be mostly among traders themselves, among investors. And so this means that both sides of the trade are going to generate welfare. And so this is going to lead towards a higher generated investor welfare. So these are the two forces, if you want, that are going to drive the anticipation effect and the queue joining effect, but that different level is going to be at play depending upon the size of the tick. So let me now show this more visually in this, um, in this graph. And so this first graph here, so what we have on the axis is the half tick, okay? So recall we had the tick here could go from zero to two, okay? So zero would be a perfectly, you know, no tick size. A tick, a half tick equal to one would mean, you know, this is the entire dispersion in, 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 uh, in private values, okay? And so what we have here is a difference in trading rates, okay? So meaning that, so this is the difference between PBT and PT. So this means that if this is positive, it means we have more trading under price broker time than under price time. Uh, 
When it is negative, it's the reverse. So what do we observe? So as long as the tick is below around 0 0.44, what we have is that, you know, that we have more trades with price broker time than with price time. And the reason here is this anticipation effect, you know? So it's not so costly to submit orders against, you know, the, the, the standing limit orders or, or the, against the dealer. And therefore, you know, we're going to have lots of dealer in, intermediation if you want. And this is going to generate a lot of trades. In contrast, when we have that the tick becomes relatively white, we have that, you know, there is more trading uh, with, um, with price time, but there again, the dealer may be more important. So we can see this now in the right panel. So this is, this decomposes the types of trades between, so the blue line gives us customer, customer trades that is investor, investor trades. So we are, we match it with, against each other. Whereas the red line or whatever yellow line, dotted line here gives the trading rate against the dealer. Okay. And so, what we see here, so this large composition, let's say this large trading rate that we see, you know, with PBT mainly consists out of trades which are intermediate, that is, which are executed against a dealer. So we have lots of trade, but in the end, relatively little um, welfare. Okay. And so this then translates into welfare. So this is now you know, how does investor welfare look like? And again, I'm comparing PBT relative to PT, so the difference. And so what we can learn is that, you know, in terms of welfare, we see that for small ticks, this is negative, meaning that price time priority is better when the tick is small relative to this um, uh, heterogeneity in private values. Again, when the tick is larger than this 0 0.44, approximately, we have that <clears throat> welfare is larger with price broker time priority. Meaning that in this case, while we have fewer trades, you're much more matching orders from different traders and they don't need to pay the spread to the, um, to the, um, to the, um, to the dealer, okay? So this also means that we have a testable implication saying that regulators can increase investor welfare by prohibiting PBT when the tick is small. So that means that, you know, when the tick is relatively tight below 0 0.44, we have, we are better off with price time priority, oops. Whereas, you know, we are better off with price broker time priority when the tick is relatively wide. So that is, you know, so, so there is not an obvious single solution. So what we are showing is that, you know, different um, designs may be optimal depending upon if you want the characteristics of the stock um, that we have at hand. Okay. And so, so then, so I'm not sure if there are questions. I mean, may, maybe I can, maybe no, already no, heard. None for right now, we can continue. Okay, and... good. So then I continue, okay. Oh. So now we take a step back, you know. So now what we have shown is, you know, when, um, when is price time priority better than price broker time priority and vice versa? Let's now suppose that we give brokers or platforms the possibility to choose. Okay, do you want to choose for price broker time or do you want to go for price time priority? That is, we are going to endogenize the adoption of priority rules. And so here we are making the assumption that brokers are which might be not an innocuous one, or you might criticize this one, but so we are assuming here that broker maximize their client's welfare, okay? So I think, you know, even if that would not be the case, we would still get the same results, you know, suppose they would be able to charge fees, this would be related to client's welfare, you know, so even in that case, I think our result would be reinforced. What do we find? We find that it's actually a dominant strategy to adopt price broker time priority. So this means that, you know, independent of the other's broker's action, you actually want to have price broker time priority because this is going to serve the needs of your client most. However, what you have is that when the tick is small, you're actually in a prisoner's dilemma. You know, traders would actually be better off, you know, if they could say, look, we are, we are going to go for price time priority. But since we have the choice here, you know, brokers are going to indulgently choose for price broker time priority. So we have a prisoner's dilemma situation. When we have white ticks, there the price broker time coincides with the social planner's um, preferred outcome. 
Okay. So let me so let me now take a step back again. So that's another step back. I'm going to fall out of the building. I'm afraid if I take all these step backs. But so what we did now, and so this is not yet in the paper, is let's try to confront our theoretical model with the empirics. Okay. So you know, and in which situation are we? I mean, you know, are we in a situation if we look at, let's say, at, at empirical um, um, outcomes? Are we in a situation where it would be optimal to have price time priority? Or are we in a situation where we would want to have price broker time priority? So what we have shown is that, and of course, taking this model literally, what we have shown is that the critical relative tick delta, so delta tilde is about 44% of the dispersion in private values. And we showed that price time is better below that, price broker time is larger below that, um, above that. Let's come to an empirical proxy. So what we need then is spreads, you know, which would be represented for the tick. And secondly, we need information about the dispersion in private values. So when we look at the paper by Terry and Albert, you know, what we find here is that what they are finding is that on average, the dispersion in private values is about 185 basis points. But depending upon the quartile of stocks, it's ranging between 133 to 307 basis points. Their effective hull spreads are on average 21 basis points with again variation from eight to 46 basis points. So this means that if you compute a relative tick, you know, let's say the spread over these private valuations or heterogeneity in private valuations, what you find is that this varies between six to 15% with an average of around 12%. So this would suggest, you know, that at least for their stocks, that you know, again taking this model literally without anything else, you know, that we are in the range, delta is lower than this delta tilde of 44%, that price time priority is optimal. Of course, there may be huge variation within quartiles that we are not measuring here. Then the second thing we did was we looked at the paper by by Katya and Andreas, you know, on cross-listed Canadian stock. There we have that the average spread is, is a little bit larger. Unfortunately, we do not have variation in private values, but let's say assume that they would be similar to the US ones. Then I think we would come to relative tick sizes would be, which would be around 20 to 30% of the private values. Okay? And then the final point, and that's something we still need to include in the paper is, we assume two brokers. So if we have more brokers, so if we increase the number of brokers, this is somehow reducing the difference between price broker time and price time, okay? So this means that this delta tilde is going to become smaller. So this means that, you know, we might actually more move towards a range where at least for some stocks, price broker time may be more, may be optimal relative to price time. But again, take this with a grain of salt because, you know, we have been computing this, you know, very, very, very recently. Okay, so maybe I can, I can again, um, if there are questions, I can stop here for a second and then maybe still five minutes if you want, you know, if, I, if you give me the time at least to continue. It's up to you. Um, okay, sure. I mean, we might as well. We've got two in here. Um, so Jose Panalva asks, um, so suppose you can control the tick size, right? I imagine from the perspective of a regulator. Mm -hmm. um, then you would want to impose a ceiling on the tick size and impose PT. So is that accurate? Um, well, of course, I mean, if you can control the tick size, I mean, the optimal tick size here in this model would be zero. Okay, you know, right. so that, okay. that's, that's, you know, I mean, I, I didn't show that, you know, so, so, so the optimal tick size is, is, uh, is zero. Of course, this is, you know, um, then of course, everybody would trade through a market order, you know, I mean, so the dealers would do all the intermediation and that's it. Okay. Um, so here, what it would say is that, you know, you should take into account, um, so, so it's not necessarily the case that you're always better off with having PT. So you can also have situations where you are actually better off with PBT, okay? So you don't want to force everything into, into, um, into price time priority because in some certain situations when the tick is large, you know, you may actually have PBT. And so this might depend upon, you know, something which is maybe unmodeled over here, you know, thinking about the degree of competition, you know, the variation in the heterogeneity, you know, in the valuation, in the valuation, sorry, which is also um, exogenously modeled over here. Okay, we have some other questions right now, but I'll leave those for the q Okay, the good, thank you. So I have like five minutes, is that like the ID? 
Um, I mean, it's supposed to be at 45, but it's flexible. So. Okay. So let's let's. Okay. So I can I can adjust um, um, as you wish. So so one thing we we haven't discussed yet is you know. What we also argue in the paper is that priority rules may actually give incentives for off exchange reporting. So think about price time priority. And suppose you know you're a broker and you have somebody who wants to submit a market order to the market, but you know that one of your clients you know has an order at the back of the queue. Okay. So what you could do is basically say, look, I'm going to match those guys, you know, I'm going to take that order out of the queue, match it with the incoming market order. And the reported of exchange. So what this would suggest is that you know that in situations where you have price time priority, you may actually have more incentives to to do off exchange reporting. And so this would be consistent, let's say, with U.S. versus Canadian evidence, where we see much more, let's say, of exchange reporting in the U.S. compared to what we have on the, in the Canadian market. Exactly, also related to a question that you asked, because you know PBT is actually on the market already taking place um, as such. Okay. So the second thing, what we can investigate is also what is the impact of priority rules for and market fragmentation in our model. Well, what we do here is again on the horizontal axis, we have this half tick and the yellow part is the, is the fraction of trade. So this is 100% over here. So the yellow line is the fraction of trade that go through the dealer market, whereas the blue dotted line is the um, limit or the book market and the, the, the whatever orange line is the one that would be of exchange reporting, assuming that you know this takes place in price time priority. So what we see here is that, as already mentioned, you know, if the tick is zero, everything goes to the dealer. If the tick is very, very large, we know we're going to have a, a lot, a very active limit order book market and a, a relatively small participation in the in the dealer market. So, so our model also has predictions on how markets may become fragmented. Okay. Let me then maybe spend my my final two minutes, if you want, on the interpretation of a centralized versus fragmented markets. So we recall that we started off with saying, look, our model can also be in, interpreted as having price platform time priority. So suppose we have two platforms where one broker has a preference for one platform and another broker has a preference for another platform at equal prices. A centralized market would imply that those two platforms still need to implement price time priority. A fragmented market would mean, you know, that there is indeed this preferencing taking place. And so what we are saying here is that, you know, if we have this multiple market interpretation is that priority rules are going to also affect traders choices between market orders and limit orders. And so our empirical predictions or our testable implications also have implications on how order flow may look like between different markets. So for example, what we may have is that when markets are fragmented, that limit orders, sorry, limit orders are more likely to be followed by limit orders in different platforms in comparison to the same platform related to the queue jumping ID that we are having there. And finally, what we have is also that, you know, that there are incentives. So if there is this platform priority in place or price platform priority in place, again, there are incentives for brokers and for trading mechanisms to have fragmented markets because this is again an optimal decision for them in order to, even if they are willing to, to, to invest or to, to serve if you want the, the welfare of this. So we do lots of robustness and extensions. If I still have one minute, let me focus on this on this final one here. So one additional thing we do is, is we compare price time to price broker time to random matching. So recall random matching would mean that, you know, if there are two orders in the queue, you have a 50% probability of being, of being matched independent of where you are in the queue. How does this work in terms of welfare? So what we learn here is, so here we have the two curves, but what we learn in a nutshell is that when the tick is relatively small, we again have that price time priority is, is better. For intermediate ticks in between this range over here, we have that price broker time priority is better. And when we have really large ticks, we have that random matching is better. 
So the idea of random matching is to some extent, it's, it's an exaggerated version of price broker time because you know, arriving late to the party here you know, doesn't hurt you. You know, so and arriving early into the game also, you know, doesn't have value because you're going to be randomly matched. Okay. So let me conclude. So what we have tried to show is that priority rules affect traders' choices between market orders and limit orders. When the stick is small relative to the dispersion in private values, we have that welfare is higher with price time priority. When the tick is wide, PBT yields higher welfare. Brokers will adopt PBT whenever they have the choice to do that. And we show that markets may fragment differently depending upon the priority rules that are in place. And so in a nutshell, I think we contribute to the debate related to priority rules showing that you know, a one size fits all rule may not necessarily be optimal. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Hans. That was excellent. Okay. So uh, I've turned on the raise hand function. So if you want to okay. uh, ask Hans a, Hans a question, you can raise your hand and uh, I'll unmute you. Um, uh, we have a question. Oh, Pank Pankaj, this is quick. All right, Pankaj, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Well, great paper. I enjoyed, uh, enjoyed the presentation. Uh, my question is, you mentioned that uh, the optimal tick size is uh, zero, right? So then uh, why do we have like prohibitions again, log markets and all these things? So is, am I missing something here? Uh, if zero is the optimal tick size and even the dark pools, they do uh, zero crossing. Yeah. So I understand where you're coming from. Okay. And can get some more handle yeah. on it. Yeah. So, so that's, that's a, so it's a very uh, good question. So of course here, you know, the, the optimal tick size is zero because of the role of the dealers. Okay, you know, because in that case, you know, so by, uh, by design, we assume that, you know, there are always dealers who are willing to make the market at, you know, at a price which is equal to zero. So that's why we are having this, um, you know, that's why I was saying, you know, and at least in this setup, you know, the optimal tick size is zero. If you take the dealers away, you know, so if you don't have these dealer specialists around, um, then of course the optimal tick size may not be zero anymore. So, um, and, and I cannot provide you on, let's say an answer on this, but you know, so, 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 so that's coming here from, from that particular peculiarity of the model. Thank you. Okay. We also have um, some remaining questions in the chat from uh, Marius, Peter Lerner and uh, Pete Kyle. Um, I think Pete is more of a, a note, but. I don't know, maybe he wants to talk about that too. So if you guys want to raise your hand, if you're in the Q&A. Um, um, yeah, so let's see here. Um, um, I actually had a question about using multiple brokers. So for example, if I'm a high frequency trader, can I just pick a broker to go to? Right. So, and then I can like hide and kind of take advantage of this Q jumping. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's a very good uh, suggestion and remark. So here we are assuming, you know, you can only have, have one broker. And of course you could think about, you know, um, so, so here the idea would be, you know, that it is very difficult, you know, if you see another broker in the game, you know, you see, let's say a limit order of your own broker and you would want to submit a limit order that you first are going to say, look, I'm going to log into my other broker, you know, and then I'm going to submit my, uh, my order. So that's something that, you know, that we are not assuming, but indeed, you know, I can imagine that there might be a group of traders who might be, you know, having connections to the different types of brokers, you know, um, and that could somehow undo the friction that we're having here. So, but, but that's, of course, that's a friction you're somehow, you know, needing here in this model, you know, um, if, we remove, if we remove that friction yet, yeah, then we go back to, let's say one, one particular market. Thank you. Okay, I think we have a question from Pete. Pete, I think you can yeah. go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, yep, yes. we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, you know, I have this uh, little paper with Nina Lee that proposes what we call continuous scale limit orders, but you could think of it as more like flow trading orders. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially a zero tick size as well as a zero minimum lot size. Um, and it seems to me that uh, our little proposal solves all these problems of broker priority, time priority, price priority, um, within an exchange. It doesn't solve it across exchanges, but um, you know, that's kind of a, a, a different issue, but it seems like it solves it within exchanges and that that might be kind of consistent with where your paper winds up that 
uh, maybe a zero tick size is pretty pretty good. Yes. Yeah, so, 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 thanks for your question. So, I, I definitely need to have a closer look at at, uh, at your paper. Um, so, as I mentioned here, you know, the zero tick size, at least you know, in the setup where we have this dealer specialist, you know, who can quote, let's say, without any cost. That that's that's driven by that. Um, we need to look into the game, you know, where we um, where we wouldn't have those dealer specialists. Um, secondly, and I think also, um, you know, the idea of having these multiple markets. Um, as you are saying, that's something that we definitely need to, you know, that we that we can uh, further spend time on. So I, I need to look more into into this in order to to be able to provide you, let's say, a more uh, um, how should I say, informed uh, answer on this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. So um, I don't see any further hands. So people still have questions. Um, but I did have another one, which is about um, how the dealers impact welfare, because currently they're just, you know, they just absorb these trades and they're kind of, they have an infinite mm -hmm. balance sheet. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no sense in which um, dealers absorbing these trades in like when everyone is just relying on the specialist market, mm -hmm. um, when tick sizes are small, big, I don't remember which one it was. Mm -hmm. um, but have you guys looked at it, it allowing some kind of um, welfare cost to hitting the dealer? So, so, the, so here the welfare cost for hitting the dealer is, let's say, all the rents that the dealer can make. You know, so, so, so what we are assuming here for the dealer is, you know, that he has, let's say, the fundamental that he has that he values the stock at the fundamental value, and that he doesn't have, let's say, a private valuation for this. So it means that you know if he submits a limit, if he has is making the market there, he's making some rent, right? Because he can basically you know sell the asset at let's say a relatively high price, you know, and for him it has um, um, only a value which is equal to let's say to the to the common to the common value of the of the stock. So what we are assuming is that you know in this model is that you know these rents that the dealer are making that those are competed away by let's say competition. So so the idea here is that you know, every dealer has a certain cost, you know, of monitoring the market. And these rents are, are, are competed away. And so this, it's actually a very interesting question because, so what we are assuming here is that, you know, that these dealers are somehow randomly selected, okay? Because if that wouldn't be the case, you know, if you would basically say there's also queue formation, you know, for the dealers, then in that case, you know, the queue position of the dealer would again, potentially imply that the dealer may have certain rents, okay? And so this means that in this way, we somehow don't have that dealers are making profits. But nevertheless, let me show you one additional slide, if you allow me, is dealers are still making a, a huge indirect contribution to welfare because, you know, they facilitate trading, okay? And so what, I, what we have done here, and so this is not in the paper, is we basically look at the contribution. So if we compare the game price time, or pr let me start with price broker time. So if we compare the game price broker time with dealers versus price broker time without dealers, their contribution relative to the contribution of dealers when we have price time with dealers and price time without dealers. So it's, just a di it's like a difference in difference, okay? You know, so dealers contribute something, but do they contribute more in one regime relative to the other? And what we learn here is that, you know, when the tick is small, and this is exactly what you were referring to, Cameron. So when the tick is small, what we are seeing is that dealers are contributing actually more to welfare under PBT than they would do under price time priority, exactly for the reason, you know, that you're going to match a lot of orders, okay? You know, these anticipation effect pushes them, you know, to, to be involved a lot. In contrast, when the tick starts to become larger, what we're having is that actually under price time priority, the dealers are actually providing more, if you want, additional welfare to the game than, um, than under price broker time priority. Okay. So, so dealers don't, even though dealers don't make profits, you know, they, they still contribute to welfare because they, you know, they, they make trading possible if you want. Okay. Right. Okay. That's a, that's an interesting, yeah, I like that. Okay. Um, so I think 
now is probably a good good place to stop the the formal talk. So um, everyone, give a silent round of applause for Hans and your own homes. Thanks again for the opportunity. And uh, um, so on such competition with such a, you know with election day, so um, um, you know. Yeah. So let's hope uh, you know this is going to become uh, the perfect outcome. Okay. Yeah. So.